Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 94, recorded March 13th, 2013. Steve Huffman. Triangulation is brought to you by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. All right, feather the props. I've got my scarf on. It's time for Triangulation, the show uh, that I look forward to every week because I get a chance to meet and greet and talk with and ask questions of the smartest people in the world, the people who are powering the tech industry forward. And today we've got somebody great. I'm very excited about uh, welcoming Steve Huffman to the show. Uh, Steve, in 2005, uh, with uh, a fellow named Alexis Sohanian, founded Reddit. And of course, Alexis has been on the show. It's great to have you, Steve. Hey, thanks. Happy Welcome. to be here. Uh, a few years later, uh, co-founded Hipmunk, hence uh, the scarf that I'm wearing, which is a really great uh, you know, multi-site travel search page. I've used it a lot. And the thing that you came up with on Hipmunk, which I really like, is the Agony Index. Ah, yeah, good. <laughs> Our first idea. It Was it really? You, yeah, that was that, that was the idea I think we started with at Hipmunk. Yeah, it's kind of your trademark. The idea being that you could sort by departure time or by price, but why not search by agony, which is a combination of how many stops, how long it is, probably what time of the day it is, things like that. It's a great idea. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Glad you like it. Good. Welcome. We actually had scheduled Steve uh, a few weeks ago, and then... Very annoyingly, Sony scheduled this PS4 press conference at the same time, and so we, uh, you were very kind to let us reschedule. So um, we're we're glad to, glad to get you uh, back on. Well, the show. hopefully the the PS4 lives up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you game? Are you a gamer at all? Uh, I have been for the majority of my life, but the last year I haven't I haven't gamed with you as much time. gusto as I would have liked. You don't have time. Yeah, yeah. time is short, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Where, so uh, you, did you meet Alexis at the University of Virginia? Is that where you guys met? Yeah, we met. We lived together all four years, basically. Uh, he lived across the hall from me freshman year, and then we lived together until we graduated. That's neat. And yeah. that freshman year, you found you had computer science in common? What was it that, that brought you together? Um, no, we actually had video games in common. Ah. Uh, I think we bonded over Gran Turismo... <laughs> Three, I think I just come out, <laughs> which everyone was on the PS2, um, and then, and then our friendship was really solidified when Grand Theft Auto Three came out uh, during finals that year. <laughs> during final, this is I don't understand how kids get through college anymore. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, because it was quiet hours in the dorm, and there was twenty guys packed in my room taking turns. Oh man, beating up prostitutes and hijacking uh, cop cars. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Those were the days, man. <laughs> <laughs> God, it just seems like a few years ago to me. Well, I guess it, in, a, in a way, it, it really is a few yeah, it years ago, to be honest. Yeah, you weren't in. Were you? In, were you guys in college when you started Reddit? When it? When, when so it, we we were accepted into Y Combinator before we graduated. Wow. Uh, that that spring. So this was 2005, and then we didn't actually start working on Reddit until we graduated, um, which was June of 2005. What was the pitch to uh, Y Combinator? Well, the pitch to Y Combinator was, we're going to build this thing to allow you to order food from your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and actually, we, we had met Paul with that idea. Um, Paul Graham. Prior to Paul Graham, yeah, prior to Y Combinator even existing. And he loved the idea. And then when he announced Y Combinator, um, I had emailed him thanking him for his time talking to us about this idea, you know, a month prior. And he said, we should apply to Y Combinator, um, you know, we'll get in. And so we did apply with that food ordering idea. And then we were rejected based on that idea, which was extremely frustrating. Um, uh, but afterwards, they gave us a call and basically said, you know, we really like you guys. We just don't like that idea right now. Granted, this is in 2005. There are no iPhones, there are no apps, restaurants aren't on the internet. So there's lots of problems with that idea at the time. Um, As I remember, the, the kind of the failure of it was you had called a pizza place and they never, they never delivered the pizza because it was coming in by a fax and they never yeah. checked the fax machine. Yeah, there's, it's just, 
<laughs> it was going to work then. But you know, there's a company now called Order Ahead, yeah. which is Combinator doing like exactly the thing oh, we yeah. had back then, and they're doing really well. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's, I'm glad to see it. It still has legs. Um, I, I live by a thing in, in this. We live in Petaluma, just up north of you. And yeah. uh, Petaluma, it's called PetalumaFoodTaxi.com. And it's a deal between the taxi services and the restaurants. And you call. I guess it goes to the taxi dispatcher. And then they call the restaurant. And they come and they get it and they bring it to you. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem everybody has. Yeah. Uh, so the, it's... The solution is inevitable. But it might, be a, it might be each town has its own local uh, version of that instead of a massive national effort. I don't know. I'm, I'm rooting for order ahead. All we'll right. See. You, uh, Hipmunk uh, has been, I think, has been very successful. Yes. What, how, how much after uh, Reddit did you found the Hipmunk? Was that, when was that? Um, I left Reddit in 2009 uh, in the fall, and then we started Hipmunk summer of 2010. So was that because you wanted a new, something new to do? What was... What, well, um, I left Reddit um, when basically the contracts from our acquisition expired. Um, and at the time, I was pretty burnt out on Reddit. Um, you guys, you know, typically you get, you, somebody buys you, Condé Nast bought you, you get, you have to stay there like three years to get the money and then you can leave. And, you know, it was a lot of fun and Reddit, you know, grew tremendously during those three years. And it continues to grow today, obviously. Um, but there, there's, uh, during that time, you know, I was often the guy kind of taking things like personal responsibility for a lot of our, our, our missteps and whatnot and having a thousand angry Redditors in your inbox every morning. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> what, uh, so w when you started Reddit, were you aware of Dig? No, no, we became aware. So we started Reddit in June of 2005 and we saw Dig for the first time in probably July. They had just gone through this redesign uh, that turned it into the dig that we all knew for, for many years. Um, and it, it was in the fallout from that redesign that we kind of finally trickled across our radar screen. And, and when we saw that, we were, Alexis and I were just like, oh my God, don't tell. <laughs> uh, because it was like so similar to what we were doing and we had no clue. Um, and then obviously from then on, we were very aware of dig. Um, Did you, you see know. it as competition? Yes. Yeah. We always felt like we were chasing Dig. Um, and it was frustrating because every press piece about us always mentioned Dig and always kind of positioned Reddit as playing second fiddle to Dig, um, which was true. Um, but we felt like, you know, because we, we built Reddit without knowing about Dig, we, our, our, our take was substantially different. And I think our, our philosophies of the two companies were substantially different, which contrasts that with Many, there's probably hundreds of competitors, somebody building a better dig, somebody building a better Reddit, that sort of thing that kind of came and went over the years. Right. But yeah, we, I mean, we were always very aware of what Dig was doing. At least Alexis was. I didn't, I didn't even like going there. It would make me so angry. <laughs> I'm glad you admit that. And of course, you got the last laugh. What, yeah, it's funny how that worked out. Yeah. What, you know, Dig really floundered because people started gaming it, I think. <laughs> Um, that, that was a big part of it, and I think Dig, they didn't do a great job at preventing the gaming, which is something at Reddit we spent a lot of time on. And they, 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 they had these series, I, I forget the exact stories now, but they basically lost the trust of their users because it's such a, a gameable thing. Right. And, you know, the users kind of, sometimes they just have to give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, and Dig lost that ability, which which I think ultimately hurt them because the, the communities, they're so fickle. And when they get angry, it's this, you know, lynch mob. And, and there's a couple times with Dig where the user base just got, you know, fairly or unfairly just so upset. Oh, furious. Yeah. Uh, very, I was very aware of it because Kevin Rose is a friend. And so I was watching kind of on the sidelines and, um, the gaming seemed to be a problem, but also it's very hard to manage community. And at some point the power struggle between, dig the, the, the company and the community became ugly. Yeah. And there yeah. was no way to recover from that, I don't think. No, it's, it's, it's really tricky. And I think Reddit, in, in hindsight, we did a good job at that, although we didn't, um, we didn't, we didn't know it at the time. And, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing at all. Um, but I think we were pretty authoritative, but also very honest. Um, so we would say when we banned something, we'd say, yep, we banned it. And here's why. Um, and, and Dig was a little, you know, the users were often suspicious, you know, yeah. was this, was this not banned? What's going on? And that kind of, I think, festered over the years. No, I think that that's exactly it. 
I'm very, I mean, Reddit is so fascinating because it's such a successful uh, example of a company and, and a community uh, being aligned. Yeah, was that uh, intentional? How aware of you were you of how important this was? Because it turns out to be everything. Yeah, I mean, again, it's one of those things in hindsight, it, it makes total sense. Um, but at the time, we were just doing the only thing we knew how to do, which was, you know, be, be, be ourselves. Yeah. And Reddit's personality, I think, to a large degree, was an extension of mine and Alexis's personalities. I think you're right. And, you know, now I, I think that's when people ask me for startup advice, that's something I talk about. But at Reddit, we didn't do it on purpose. We just kind of, you know, we didn't, we didn't know any better. Um, and, and it worked out, you know, to our benefit, fortunately. What, what do you, how would you characterize that attitude? What was it that you guys were, um, was there a well, philosophy that you had? Well, so we started to develop this over the years. Um, you know, when we started, we just wanted to build a site for us. Um, and a lot of the, the kind of Reddit things that, that became important, we did out of laziness. For example, um, you know, we never banned content. And it wasn't because we had this deep down, this deep respect for the freedom of speech. We just didn't have time to write like anti-spam. <laughs> the years, right, we did have to write anti-spam. And then, you know, some situations would arise, you know, one of our advertisers is upset about a top post, you know, do we take it down? And then we had to actually go back and think, okay, now what do we care about free speech? And then, you know, we kind of learned that way. And, and we, we, we often would just choose to, to fight the fight because, because why not? Um, especially when we we're at Condé, it, it was nice because we, we almost felt like, uh, you know, kids just, you know, <laughs> Right, it's just like oh, con, you got dorks, right? We'll we'll do it our way. Well, that's the, that's the other thing that Reddit is a real uh, great example of a poster child for is a company acquired by a huge company that didn't lose its soul to the huge company, and in fact, subsequently, Condi has almost spun it out into its own division. I tell you, they certainly tried to eat, eat, eat our souls, um, but uh, fortunately, you know, I because I, I left, you know, I left pretty frustrated at Condi. I couldn't hire. Um, we were only six people when I left. Oh, really? Uh, and it was, it was a pretty large site at that time. Um, now it's even bigger now, but now they're independent. Um, they've got a big team. They've got their own space. They've got a lot of independence and things are really looking good. So you feel good. I mean, I, I, I feel like uh, the, the Reddit of today is very little change from the first editions of Reddit. Product uh, hasn't changed substantially since 2009. And... Really, I mean, 90% of Reddit, you know, with, with absent user-created Reddits has existed since 2006 or so. Um, you know, and, and it was funny because when we, were, when we were working on things, you know, traffic would go up, you know, every month or so. And, you know, Paul Graham, he, he'd always say, you know, you have to keep adding features because it makes the site feel alive. And, and that's what makes users come back. And so we'd add features and traffic would, would go down. And we'd be like, oh, man, that's weird. And sometimes... You know, we'd add features and traffic would go up or the site would be slow and traffic would go up. And so we started thinking, like, should we just not add features and keep the site slow and traffic goes up? It turns out traffic was just going up and it didn't matter what we did. <laughs> so we just kind of we just kind of do what we want. We didn't do a whole lot. Um, basically, just keep the thing going, tweak it here and there. Um, actually, you know, 50 percent of Reddit's code or so is not. You know, so Reddit's open source, but uh, there's a huge chunk of anti-cheating code. We spent a lot oh, of really? time on um, but we never talk about, you know, right. those, for obvious reasons. So gaming was, was, an, was an issue and you were able to successfully fight it off. It became an issue, yes. Uh, for the first year or so, we didn't have any production. Um, and it started to become more and more of an issue and we started to get more and more advanced. And then uh, I think the current solution they have right now is, is pretty good. You know, it's not impossible to game Reddit, but you really have to put some effort into it. And also there's gaming and there's gaming. You know, Dig started to become kind of almost very uniform uh, top 10 reasons why or top 10 things that just people knew how you would get up on dig and i don't think people have either they haven't figured that out on reddit or whatever it is makes something popular on reddit is is right because when stuff's popular on reddit it really ought to be it's good generally generally yeah um you know there, there are definitely cracks in the system um you know i just thought of one the other day i, I was i was explaining how the reddit anti-cheating worked to somebody and for the, like, you know, I was explaining this algorithm we had for five years, and then it occurred to me, like, I thought of this great way to get around that. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, I don't know if I should 
tell somebody or not, or if I should actually, you know what I should do is I should just put Hitmonk on the front page. Now we could, we you could, could do it. Use it. Use traffic. it. <laughs> so when did the AMAs start? That started. Hmm. Was that a user feature that somebody did or did, did you guys start that? So we, the feature we made the user created reddits. So users could subreddits you know, are huge. Subreddits. Fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny, subreddits. I actually implemented that feature back in 2005, but Paul Graham and Aaron Swartz hated it so bad really? that they convinced me not to release it. So we didn't re-release it until 2007, 2008, wow. something like that. What didn't they like about it? Um, they thought it was too much work, which, which, which was true. You know, the reason, you know, Reddit didn't have any categorization for a long time because we didn't want users to have to think too much when they were submitting. Right. We didn't have a strong use case for it then. You know, we had a few little ones. Uh, but during that entire time, you could go to reddit.com slash subreddit and make your own Reddit. It's just nobody knew the URL. <laughs> so we, we released the feature, and AMA, or IAMA, was one of the first ones created, I think. Um, and, you know, that went entirely on its own. But for the first while, it was never, it wasn't celebrities. It was, you know, I am a truck driver, ask me anything, or... Yeah. So two, prostitute comes up once a month, it seems like. Yeah. Um, People really all, want to know what prostitutes do. <laughs> I remember the first celebrity was either, I think it was Stevie Vai, the guitar player, or maybe Mike Rowe. Um, but I remember in the Reddit office, we were just like, jobs. Yeah. geez, the celebrities are using this. And now the president of the United States has done an Ask Me Anything. Cool. Uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and now I, Reddit puts a lot of effort into you know, soliciting those, you know, making sure things run smoothly, getting them on time and, you know, all that sort of thing. Well, and I think it's a good thing. Uh, somebody in the chat room said, and I think I agree, that it's one of the things that made uh, Reddit, uh, gave Reddit stature. Yes, um, uh, absolutely. Lots of credibility. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm looking at, we, for instance, our show Tech News Today has a subreddit. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of work for the people who did it. And I think it was all fans who did it, but boy, it looks great. It works great. And it's a great way for us to see what the top stories are. And yeah. uh, we, we use, uh, you know, uh, Tom and company use this every single day. This is fabulous. It's looking at the, the, the styles on that. Um, the RCSS editor, unless they've improved it, maybe they have, I haven't looked at it in a long time. It was atrocious. <laughs> uh, so the fact that they've taken it that far is, is Estimate to somebody's patience. Somebody's very, very patient, and it's one of their, you know, one of our fans who just, you know, uh, maybe several of them that just put their, uh, put a lot of effort into that. And look at that. I mean, total skinning. Yeah, it's it's not easy. Um, we did not make that easy for what. <laughs> well, it proves if you do something that people really want to do, it doesn't have to be easy. Yeah, you know, that was a big Paul Grahamism too. Um, he, he was always telling us, you know, if you build in tools to customize. It doesn't matter how hard they are to use, users will use them. Yeah. If you don't, they'll find a way anyway. So you may as well, you know, like, you know give them a chance. Well, I'm sure you were following with uh, interest the Violent Acres uh, story, the, the, the Reddit troll. Yep. Um, did you, were you aware of him before you left Reddit or is this something that happened all after you'd, you'd gone? I was aware of him before I left Reddit because jailbait existed before I left Reddit. Okay. Uh, and Violent Acres, you know, <laughs> It, it, it's, it's funny because we had we had an up and down relationship with him, as I did with a lot of, of a lot of users of his ilk, where basically th they would be doing distasteful things. And but Reddit was pretty big on the no censorship thing, um, and eventually they crossed the line. And I'm pretty sure Violent Acres did at some point, and I, I banned him, and, and he got really upset with me, and he's like, "Why did you ban me?" And I basically laid it out for him because you know you crossed this line, and he and he said, "Okay, well, if I if I promise to behave, will you let me back?" And, and I, was, you know, I was like, sure, which is basically my mode of operation, which is just like treat people like adults. Um, and, and so the thing about Violent Acres is no matter where, you know, the proverbial line is, he would be standing right up next to it looking over. Um, and so it was, it was always tricky because um, we knew we had that content, but we didn't, you know, we didn't really have a good solution because we didn't want to ban it all. We felt that would, you know, create more more trouble than we were actually fixing um so it, that was that was a troublesome I, you know i was and i was really sad to see that whole story i felt like just about everybody involved looked um looked looked pretty poor in that whole affair yeah i, I agree it's a no-win situation and trolls are really uh tough anybody who has a community and you know of course we've had a 
communities associated with Twit, and then before that with my radio show for almost 20 years. And, uh, you know, I've seen forums uh, get completely decimated by trolls. You know, it's like gardening. If you let the weeds start to take over, uh, pretty soon you don't have any, uh, everybody leaves, and all you've yeah. got left is trolls. And, yep. and I've, I've literally shut down several forums because that's basically what yeah. happened. He was a funny one because he actually, he also would do us a big favor, which was um, remove actual child porn, right. which would come time to time. But it was something, it was, it's so icky, like we didn't even want to, you know, it's not something look on in the office and want to deal with and think about. And so that was, that was kind of our unspoken agreement is you delete the real illegal stuff and we'll, you know, we'll not give you such a hard time on the, you know, creepy stuff. Oh, that's interesting. I bet you're a little glad to be out of the whole thing. I was really glad to not be involved when that went down, and I was really thankful that nobody asked my opinion on the matter at the time. <laughs> I was just like, this is, this is tough. It's um, a no-win. It's really hard to talk about it. It's really hard to, you know, ev everybody just looks bad. Um, and, and, and I empathize completely with what Reddit was going through. That's, hmm. that's a tough line to, to, to walk. Are, do you, are you still close with the people who are there? Do you know, are there people there who you started it with and so forth, or is it all Who's there was there when I was there. Um, okay. But I still, you know, I know those guys and, and I chat with them. Uh, they ever call up and say, Steve, what would you do? Uh, no, they don't. And I think they should more often. But um, <laughs> I think they should, too. But it's just ego talking. No, um, I think I think. Um, well, you you know, this is you're on. A, you've done your, your at least your second startup now. Um, a startup bears the stamp of its founders. And uh, it's very hard for a startup to continue after the founders are gone, I think. Yeah, and, and, you know, one of the things to Reddit's credit, you know, uh, what, what, I, what I sense from them is, is they actually don't know why Reddit's working, um, so they don't want to change it too much, um, which, which, is, which is fine because Reddit is working and uh, it doesn't need a whole lot of changing. Um, there's some probably big things that I would do tomorrow if I could. Uh, like? Uh, I, would, I would fix the front page. I think... Hasn't changed, hasn't changed since 2006. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, I would just be more deliberate about, um, I'd be very deliberate and transparent about choosing which reddits go on the front page yeah. uh, for the purpose of getting more variety onto the front page. Because right now it's very redundant. Um, you know, pics, funny, WTF, advice animals, it's all basically the same reddit. Um, and so I'd probably try to come up with some other solution. And I think the community would be generally receptive to that if you didn't, um, if, you, if you did it in a kind of a fair way, you know, randomly choose or something like it that. It is tricky because you don't want to start getting in the position where you're dictating content. Right. Um, but you could do something like, you know, I'd probably try to find Reddits that are just diverse. And you could do that by looking at the variety of domain names submitted to each Reddit and just make sure there's not too much overlap. Because um, you don't need to show Pics and Funny at the same time all right. the time. Right. It, it basically dilutes, it dilutes all the content because Reddit's got all this amazing content. Um, but for the most part, you have to really look for it to find it. That's a very good point. That's a really good point. You, um, you, I think a lot of people, and certainly my first reaction was, oh, it's Pics and Funny. Yeah. That's Reddit. Yeah, and, it, and, and it's funny because that wasn't Reddit originally. Reddit originally actually had a much better content, at least um, I should say more diverse content on the front page. And then Pics and Funny took over because it's easy to digest and easy to submit, and, and it is funny. Um, but it, it's... Now, now there's all this amazing stuff, you know, the IAMAs and the Ask Reddits and all the, the little subcultures that are exist that exist. Um, you know, it's you want the, you want people to see those. You want Reddit to take credit for those, and I think it would help Reddit grow um, to to surface that content more often. I I actually do think that that's probably why the IAMAs and the subreddits are so important. Is it draws people into into Reddit not at the first page but at a deeper level. Yeah. And, you know, Reddit, Reddit's always had this, you know, the outlier statistic for us is we had, you know, 10 page views per user or something like that. Wow. Um, and, and, and amongst our top users, Reddit users, they're just on the site all day because it is really addictive. Um, yes. I find myself, you know, still now just as a user, you know, I rarely comment to really submit. I'm actually, ironically, I'm not a very social guy online. And, um, you know, I can lose a whole hour in the mornings. Oh, like easy. I have a pool now before I get to work because it's just like, that's a whole hour. My life is be better. I just spend an hour on Reddit. <laughs> so where do you go on Reddit? Um, let's see. 
I, I, I do venture into picks for funny from time to time when I, when I need to laugh, when I'm just, when my brain is fried. Um, I love, I love ask Reddit and circle jerk, uh, combined. I think those two, you know, circle jerk is a satirical version of the rest of Reddit basically. Um, which is generally how I feel about Reddit these days. Um, that, that one is great. That one is great. Um, and I am as is, is great of course too. You know, you know, the, I think like most people, you know, the, the, the best content is in the comments. And so Absolutely. anywhere discussion is, is where I like to hang out. And, and really that's why Reddit succeeds because the community, uh, the part, the people who participate are interesting and funny and they say interesting and funny things. And I wish there were some formula for knowing how to attract those people, not attracting the other people. Yeah. I, you know, I wish I could tell you. <laughs> is it the karma system? How important is that? Um, you know, it's a good one. You know, karma's funny because we, Reddit never didn't have karma. That was like a day one feature. Um, I actually have my notebook that when we were moving to Boston from Virginia um, of my brainstorming of what we were actually going to build on Reddit when we started developing. And karma was one of the first ideas. And, you know, I think Reddit would work without karma, but it's, 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 it's a nice thing to talk about. Right? It's, 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 it's like talking about the weather, right? It's always this, this fallback to keep users amused. <laughs> and, and it creates this sense of injustice. It gets people emotionally involved sometimes, which I think is really helpful. Um, but it's hard to say for sure because we've never not had karma. Uh, but we used to play with it a lot, uh, for example, because um, you know, your karma can go negative, but we would never display it as negative because we felt like if you go to Reddit, you submit something and it gets downvoted and you have negative 10 karma, that would be, that would be depressing. Um, so we'd always just pour it out at one or so. Unless your karma was so bad that it was funny, then we would show it again. Uh, <laughs> Negative a thousand. <laughs> something like that. And there's a few of those users who were so bad that they became jokes in themselves for achieving negative karma. Yeah, often it's the comments that are the best part of, of, of any post. Um, and, the, and the interaction between the commenters... Um, the design, it was very smart, this threading and the way it moves in and out so you can really follow it and how the karma can hide stuff. And it's just all very well thought out. Very, and it sounds like it was, it was almost born whole, that you didn't really, that you, you had something there at the beginning that was almost Reddit. Well, so the first version of Reddit didn't have comments. Um, oh, I guess I'm wrong. Um, and the comments actually, I, I, I'm actually really very proud of the comments because um, we did put a lot of thought into that. Um, I, I initially started with, um, I wanted to capture Slashdot's comments. Um, I was right. a big Slash user. I really loved Slashdot. Um, and, 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 you know, so Slashdot had the one through five ranking system, the right. moderating system. And I wanted to do something similar to that, but we already had the voting thing. So that seemed very natural. And then, you know, we worked very hard on the threading because what we wanted to do was you know, make sure the best comments were surfaced and, and make sure the worst comments were just instantly collapsed. Right. And so it's a tricky edge case where if, a, you know, somebody says something stupid or racist or whatever, and somebody has a very, very clever reply, we wanted to make sure that clever reply was visible. So we put a lot of effort into making sure that the threads that lead to the best comments are also visible, but everything else disappears. Um, and, and it's worked really well. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about the comments. The comments have almost are, are almost unchanged since the first version. It, you know, you look at Reddit and it seems like a national treasure. <laughs> it's like there are a few things on the internet, uh, Wikipedia, Reddit, where they feel like they've been there as long as the internet's been around. Patently not. You're actually fairly young in, in internet time. But, but it just, I can't think, it wouldn't be the internet without Reddit. It's, it's, I'm, I'm really happy to hear you say that. Um, it's, it's a little, it's, it's, it's weird for me since Reddit is. It's yours. Finding thing in my life, basically. Right, right. Uh, and so I'm, I'm always kind of blown away. You know, and we spent, Alexis and I, years going around just hoping somebody, like hoping we'd meet somebody who had heard of Reddit. <laughs> just to ask, hey, have you ever heard of Reddit? And then we go, oh, what? What? Like so this book reading site, like, like what is that? <laughs> and now, I met, last year I spoke at state um at this like startup weekend thing and i had no idea how big reddit was at colleges i mean i was completely shocked yeah um and my my younger brothers 
you know, the oldest one is seven years younger than me. He's telling me Reddit, like everybody at high school uses Reddit. And I was like, really? <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. You know, I, and I had no idea for the longest time. It's, it's really, it's really cool. Oh, it's huge. Well, I think you could get, by the way, you could thank Dig a little bit because I think what happened with it is a lot of people said, oh, Dig, great idea, bad execution. And then everybody would say, oh, but you have you seen Reddit? It really, that's the right way to do it. And so in some ways, the dissatisfaction that grew with Dig helped Reddit a lot. Dig was definitely the front runner. Like they absorbed all of the criticism. You know, they yes. made, they legitimized that whole concept. Um, and, and we used to tell ourselves, and this is the same thing we say at Hitmonk, actually. You know, every Reddit user knows about Dig and uses Reddit instead. Yes. But true. Um, and so all we have to do is just wait, right? They will eventually discover Reddit and they will stay. And, and that's, that's, that's the same way we feel about Kayak now with Hitmonk, um, which is, you know, everybody who uses Hitmonk knows about all of our competitors but uses us on purpose. And we actually, feel like using us on purpose is really valuable. That's actually true. That's true, because Kayak preceded you, I guess. I mean, certainly I used it before I used Hipmunk. When Hipmunk came along, it was a better Kayak. And we already knew what, what Kayak was, so you didn't have to explain what you did. You just did it better. Yeah, and, and it's a little bit different, because with Kayak, we straight up just copied their business model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do this better. Um, with Dig, uh, fortunately, you know, we, we, we didn't start from that position of copying, which right. I, helped us a lot. It was simultaneous. Yeah. Um, and having, a, you know, pe people always talk about, you know, well, why didn't somebody just build a Reddit clone? You know, they're just, they're just going to copy this. And a good piece of advice I got, and I think this applies to any startup, is it's really easy to copy at a shallow level, you know, a, a business or a website. But it's very difficult to copy the philosophy that, like, led to those decisions that made that website. And so, you know, the copiers will, they'll always get all the details wrong unless they have their own philosophy. And at Reddit, we felt like we had our own philosophy. We were a company with a soul. I like that. We're talking uh, to Steve Huffman, one of the co-founders of Reddit. I want to ask a little bit about Aaron Schwartz, and we'll do that. And also talk about your Udacity class. You can learn web development from one of the best web developers ever, at least certainly one of the most successful web developers ever. But before we do that, let me mention Audible.com, our sponsor. Of course, a great place to go. Everybody says, you shouldn't talk about Audible so much. Because every minute I spend listening to Audible is one minute less I spend listening to you. That's fine. It's okay. I listen to Audible all the time. I love Audible. If you love to read, you'll love Audible because what it does, it lets you listen to books the times when you can't read them when you're in the car. Save my butt commuting from tech TV for 13 years. Um, I got two hours of reading minimum done every single day. I have 500 books in my Audible library. More. And most of my red driving back and forth to tech TV. Uh, while you're at the gym, there's nothing more boring than riding a Stairmaster unless you're listening to Game of Thrones and then you don't want to stop when you're doing chores, when you're walking the dog. Audible is amazing. And I'm going to get you a, an Audible book for free. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can try it right now at audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation you'll be signing up for the gold account that's a you know that's the the subscription account where you get a book a month you also get either the new york times or the wall street journal daily read to you that's really nice and you get a book a month and your first month is free so your first book is free if you cancel in the first 30 days you'll pay nothing you get to keep the book forever the real challenge is what book because there's more than a hundred thousand titles fiction non-fiction uh, you've got thrillers, you've got mysteries, you've got sexy Fifty Shades of Grey style stuff. You've got everything from classics like Jane Eyre and uh, Great Expectations to modern thrillers from all the big names. Um, I've been listening to a John Grisham novel. It's so much fun to reread. Uh, the, uh, it's The Rainmaker. Yeah, The Rainmaker. Uh, just so many great things. Now, if you're, The Game of Thrones is coming back next week. I do hope you've read book three by now. If you haven't, hurry! Hurry to audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. Uh, now, there there are like, I don't know, five books, six, five books, I think. Uh, game Book one, you should probably start at the beginning, A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones. But then there's uh, uh, the one that's coming up, Storm of Swords. These are so great to listen to. Roy Dotrice does such a wonderful job of bringing all the characters to life. 
Look, all I can say is if you're not listening to Audible.com, you're missing out on one of nature's great treats. Give yourself a treat. Visit audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. Pick a book, listen, and enjoy. It won't cost you a thing, and I think you're going to love it. Oh, Sheryl Sandberg's book uh, came out uh, yesterday. Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead. It's one of those books I feel like I don't want to read, but I feel like I should. So getting it on Audible makes it pretty painless. I can listen to that. Uh, you know, it's six hours and 27 minutes, one long ride, and I'm done. I, I, I admit it, I do some of my homework on Audible, too. Audible.com. Give it a try today. Audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation for your free copy. Our guest is a co-founder of Reddit uh, and of Hip Monk, the travel site. And I was wearing the Hip Monk scarf, but it got a little hot. Steve Huffman is here. You teach a class? I think this is so cool. People can take it right now on Udacity, which is the uh, online... Uh, courses. Is this a free class? Yeah, yeah it's free. Um, it's seven units, and it basically we take it from the very, very basics of web development to building, you know, talking about how to build a, build a big scalable site like Reddit. You literally say introduction to HTTP. <laughs> I mean, it's really, you start at the very beginning. Take it from the, from, from the, from the top, uh, basically, you know, and it's not even like the Rails top, right? It's the the, the top top, like how does HTTP work, you know, the basic protocol. Because I think that's, you know, if you understand that, you can you have a better understanding of the more complicated stuff out there. Do you do you teach this differently than you learned when you were a student? Did you learn some things and decide to do something a little different? Um, you know, that's a good question. You know, a, a lot of, you know, I learned web development largely doing Reddit. Um, right. You know, I, I, I could program when we started Reddit, but I hadn't really, you know, I'd never really had a website. Um, and... And so, I, you know, I, I tried to basically teach the things that I wish I had known, you know, when we started, um, you know, because when, when you're starting web development, you, you, you're bombarded with different frameworks and libraries and, you know, Rails and Backbone and Node and all this stuff. And I think, you know, if you have an understanding of what those things are doing, um, you can make much better, decision, much better decisions and probably actually the best decision is probably not to use those sorts of things right away. Um, and and that, that's what I wish I had known when we first got started. Well, didn't Alexis tell me that you wrote it first in Lisp? Did it, was, am I imagining that? Oh, that's true. Um, Lisp was one of my favorite languages. It's actually how we met Paul Graham originally, because um, I was a big Paul Graham fan. And yeah. before Paul was famous for Y Combinator, he was popular for the essays, half of which were about evangelizing Lisp. Yeah. Uh, and and about how programming was an art, was an art and you were artists, Hack, absolutely hackers and art. What did he, was it? Hackers and artists. I can't remember the name of it. Um, yeah, I love Paul Graham. His it's, it's how I came to him too. Brilliant essays. Brilliant. Um, he, uh, he's and it's funny the way he speaks in person is very much like how he writes. Yeah. Um, and when he gives a speech, he actually just reads his essay, which is also kind of amusing. Now, did you, did you learn Lisp in high school? When did you learn Lisp? Uh, it was one of the first languages I learned. Um, Which, by the way, Eric Raymond would say is why you're such a good programmer. I'm going to mention Eric Raymond in a sec because he's the reason I started learning. Um, when I first got access to the Internet at home, whenever, whenever that was a possibility, probably 96 or so, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I alta vista for how to be a hacker, <laughs> um, you know, meaning it in the sense of like, you know, breaking into systems and that sort of thing. But the first response or the first result was Eric Raymond's essay called How to Be a Hacker. And in there, he has some sentence in there that really kind of changed my life, which was at some point you should learn Lisp because you may not, you know, you may not use it, but you'll, it'll forever change the way you think about programming. And so my next search was for Lisp, um, which led me to Lisp and Paul Graham eventually. Did you uh, learn Lisp proper or Scheme or, I mean, what, how did you do it? Lisp was what, what I used for the most part. Um, CMUCL was what, written, was what Reddit was written in, and that's been largely replaced by SBCL. But um, I go back to Schemes, particularly it's uh, Racket. Racket. Uh, Love Dr. It, Racket. Everybody should yeah. download it. It's free. It's incredible. It's it's great. Um, the documentation's great. The language is really cool. Uh, in fact, I, I often tell kids, ask me, and I'm sure that they just blow me off when I say this. I want to be, same question. I want to learn how to program. I want to be a hacker. My son asked me that. I said, okay, there's an MIT book called uh, uh, Structure of Computer Pro... Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. Bingo. SICP.org. And you download that. It's free. 
And you download mm -hmm. Dr. Racket, and it has a Dr. Racket uh, has a special mode for learning. Yep. And you work your way through that. And the thing that they say in there, which I think is brilliant, is you're not learning how to teach a, a computer how to do stuff. That's not what programming is. You're learning how to describe a problem. Yeah. And if, if you can make it through all the way through that book, you can program. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty advanced. It's, it's really cool because I think the last chapter of that book is basically build a virtual machine, which is one of the more, you know, Amazing. serious things actually do. So you, I take it you have worked your way through that book? I have, although I didn't finish it until a couple of years ago. Um, I had been programming quite a while yeah. before I managed to actually finish it. But I, it, it, was, I'm, it was a really I'm on a, I'm pace of about a chapter a year. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's fun. It's a great. Uh, it's wonderful, and it's all free, and it works on any machine, and you can download it and do it, and you will learn something very different than, you know, uh, C or C plus plus. Or I mean, you're going to learn something that's completely different mindset. But I, I take it, Steve, that it was very influential for you. Yes, it, it really is. Um, and it's, it's Eric, Eric Raymond was exactly correct. It forever changed the way I thought about programming. Yeah. Every programmer should learn C, Lisp, and maybe Prolog. And then you will have had your mind sufficiently blown, I think. Two out of three for me. I haven't tried Prolog. <laughs> Trippy. I'll, I'll have to work on that one. Um, no, I think Lisp is amazing. Um, uh, and I think if you understand it, it, it it's it, it's kind of so, because it's so fundamental, it's so primitive. Well, you know, the irony of Lisp is is it was the second programming language right. after after Fortran, really, in terms of like mainstream languages. Right. And language like Python and Ruby still haven't caught up to everything. Yeah. Having said that, writing Reddit in Lisp is nuts. Uh, that was an adventure. <laughs> Especially as like a newbie web programmer, um, I, I definitely made it hard on myself. There are no, are there, are there web libraries? Is there any? <laughs> There's this guy, um, Eddie Weiss, Eddie Weiss, something like that, German professor, who is a very prolific Lisp library writer, and he wrote this web framework called TBNL, which stands for To Be Named Later, and I think it's now called Hutch and Toot. He finally named it. Um, he wrote. Uh, the template language. He wrote the CSS language. He wrote tons of stuff. So wow. for him, we would have never gotten rid of cooking in Lisp. Wow, that's really interesting. I had no idea. However, I think uh, I think Alexis referred to this too. At some point, you realize this isn't gonna. This can't go on. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, in hindsight, it could have gone on, but at the time, yeah, we had some mysterious bug, and I didn't even know where to begin. Uh, you know, begin debugging it. And I, was, I, I still suffer from this kind of programming ADD. Um, and so when Aaron Swartz joined us, which was about five or six months into Reddit, he was a big Python nut. And so he suggested, let's just rewrite it in Python. And, and so we did. It took us about a week, I think, uh, end to end. Wow. And, and I became, from that moment on, the, you know, enemy number one to the Lisp community. Yeah, you, you, you defected, didn't you? Yeah, yeah and it's... It's the, the thing is, I don't regret it. Uh, <laughs> Python's, Python's really... Python's just, beautiful. Which, and, and Python is, makes a lot more sense. I mean, hey, thank God you didn't write in PHP. Oh, yeah, that we wouldn't have made it. Um, you know, but Python's great for teams. It's great for readability. And when you're writing something to, to last that you're going to have to deal with year after year, um, those are really important qualities. And Lisp is actually, unless you're Peter Norvig who also teaches classes on Udacity, by the way. Um, Brilliant Google scientist. Unless you were Peter Norvig, uh, you're probably not writing good Lisp code the first time around. Um, it's very difficult. There's just so many ways to do things. It's very easy to write confusing right. things. Um, However, having said that, I think that it was probably a great exercise to write Reddit and Lisp first, and that's why it only took a week to write it in Python. Well, yeah, um, you know, we, because Reddit was written at a very low level, um, we could translate it almost directly to Python because we didn't have big frameworks. So we right. weren't like, missing, you know, we didn't go to Python and said, oh, you know, where's the, you know, where's Rails or, you know, whatever the equivalent would be because it didn't exist. Um, so we basically function by function just translated it right to Python. Would have been Django, I guess. Django is just, was just coming out then. Yeah. No, I think you benefit. I mean, look, at, no one could look at Reddit and say you did anything wrong. Well, you know, Lisp, more than anything else, probably gave us our first 1,000 users um, because yeah. those guys... The you know, Lisp would, community. 
they would irrationally use anything written in Lisp just because right. it's written. Um, That's still that was, true, by the way. <laughs> you know, maybe irrational, but they're also very smart. And so we had these really smart, thoughtful users um, right. that helped get Reddit off the ground and set the tone. So I actually think it was very important, to, even for the non-language aspects. That's really interesting. That's not, that's also true about community. The, the, what you seed that community with really impacts it forever. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and and having you know seeded seeding Reddit with Lisp hackers and Paul Graham fans is a really not a bad way to start. So let's talk a little bit about Aaron. Uh, he had his own company, right? Yeah, so he was in Y Combinator the same batch Alexis and I were. So he was starting a company called Infogami. That's it. Which was basically. Um, it was, you know, build your own website, wiki sort of thing. Um, and it was actually a neat idea. And his demo was pretty impressive. Um, and then in November of that year, 2005, his co-founder had left, go back to school, I think. And I was the only engineer at Reddit. I was, you know, my head was underwater, basically. Um, Paul suggested that we merge. And, and at the time, you know, I just... I was like, okay, I guess we will. Um, you know, Paul, Paul wielded a lot of influence over us um, during that time. And so we merged Reddit and Infogami, and, and then Aaron joined us, and we had this grand plan of merging the two sites together. Tell me about Aaron. What was your experience of him? When I first met him, actually before I met him, I didn't like him at all because um, I only knew of him through his blog and, and the, his personality that creeped through in his blog. Um, and then when I met him in person the first time, you know, in June of 2005, like the first Y Combinator dinner, um, I was startled because this guy who was so, you know, arrogant and brash on his blog in person was actually very shy, quiet, very nice guy. Um, we became friends over that summer. And especially after Y Combinator left or Y Combinator ended that summer um, and, and they left to go to come out to Mountain View, um, Aaron and I started hanging out more and more and we became friends. And so when when we started working together, Aaron and I actually, were actually very close. And to this day, he's still one of the best programmers I've worked with. Um, you know, him and I, him and I pair programs. Um, and, and we didn't really know that as a vocabulary word. That was just kind of how we worked. You know, Agile wasn't really a thing yet or anything like that. Um, but we wrote a lot of code together very, very fast. Writing Reddit in a week is damn Agile. Yeah, and we probably rewrote it two or three more times um, wow. over the next few months. Because we kept, you know, first it was just straight to Python, but then we had this, this vision of, you know, all websites in our mind, all websites are basically, they're either applications like Gmail, search engines, or they're the other website, which are, just, it's just collections of things. Content. Wikipedia, blogs, they're all really just lists of, of, of things. And so Infogami and Reddit were really going to be the same thing. And we would just kind of start at either end and, and, and meet in the middle. Right. Um, and that's what we thought we were building. And, and so we built this common backend, and we rebuilt Reddit on top of that backend. And then we rebuilt Infogami on top of that backend. And, and that was when our relationship started to sour a little bit, because I didn't want to work on Infogami anymore, and Aaron didn't want to work on Reddit anymore. Right. Did you stay in touch with them during uh, demand progress and all of that? Uh, no. No, the last I spoke, so we, 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 we got acquired. Um, he was at Conde for very short time. And during that time, him and I spoke maybe once. Yeah. Um, and then when he actually left Conde, that was actually the last, his last day at Conde was the last day I spoke to him. What do you think about what happened to him? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's really sad. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a little frustrating. I, I think the press has gotten a little out of hand because I don't think the, the entire story has, has really been told. Um, it's not just government prosecution. He had his own demons. He was a troubled kid yeah. for many years. Um, and so it's, it's, it's frustrating, you know, and I, I, I wish, you know, I, 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 part of me regrets not staying friends with him um, because I, I think for anybody who's close to him, it was obvious that he, he, he's, he, was, he was a troubled kid. He, he had, for his, I think, entire life had, had trouble kind of existing in, in, in our society. Um, that was kind of one of his defining characteristics. Right. And and so, honestly, it didn't surprise me entirely, um, but it's 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 a real shame. I think. Oh yeah. It's, it, Huge it's, loss. Yeah, he's he's a smart guy, um, and you know, him and I don't always agree uh, on on much, but 
he was very, very smart and very prolific. Um, the kid could really crank when he got his mind set on something. Yeah. Ah, oh, I hate to end on a sad note. Let's talk about Hipmunk. Is yeah. it in Python also? It's all Python. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, a lot of the same stuff we, we carried over from Reddit. Actually, a lot of the same team too. Oh. Uh, you know, Alexis was with us for a while. He's still a big evangelist, and and Chris Lowe and David King, who are my 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 two best henchmen at Reddit, are here now. Roles. And it's going well? Yeah, things are going great. Um, you know, Hitmunk's a lot of fun to work on. It's, it's a completely different beast. You know, when, when I left Reddit, I had in mind, you know, it's like, oh, I've, I've learned all these like great lessons about startups and, and technology and the internet and, and all this stuff. You know, the next startup's going to be so easy. <laughs> um, and we definitely, you know, acted on all of those lessons learned. But at, at Hitmunk, it's a completely different company. And now there's a whole host of other things where I've looked, I look back and I say like, if I had known that, uh, if I had known that when we started Hitmonk, we'd really be cranking. So the third one's going to be amazing. <laughs> I would guess there's pretty much an infinite set of problems. <laughs> it's, it's, a, 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 every startup's a little bit different. Yeah. You know, there, there are many paths to success, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, one last question. A hundred duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? Yes, this is easy. Um, I actually answered this question recently. A um, hundred horse-sized ducks, and I'll tell you why. Why? A duck-sized horse, um, I, excuse me, 100, yeah, 100 duck-sized horses, because a horse-sized duck is a very fearsome animal. It can swim, it can walk, and it can fly. Um, so getting away from that would be a giant pain. But if you had a bunch of duck-sized horses running around, all you have to do is, like, walk up a step. And they'd... <laughs> they can't climb trees! can't even climb stairs, right? There's, they're little mini horses, right? Um, and, and so easy. Yeah, I take the little ones. You just put them in a closet and not have to worry about it. Well, you just ruined that question for the rest of the world. That's easy. Yeah, that's what I thought, right? It's pretty obvious. <laughs> Steve, it was such a pleasure talking to you. You're just, uh, it's, it's as if you, you, you never had this, these massive successes. You're just a great guy. I really appreciate spending some time with you. My pleasure. Thank you, Steve Huffman. Hipmunk.com. If you're going to do any traveling, you, in fact, I'm about to go there, search for tickets right, my, right now myself. Uh, it, I use it all the time, and it's fantastic. And you can wear the Hipmunk scarf when you, when you search for flights and hotels. Thank you, Steve, and we'll talk to you soon, I hope. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. For the next startup, number three. It's going to be perfect this time. You'll, you'll wait and see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Triangulation. We do it Wednesdays around about 3 o'clock Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time, 2200 UTC on twit.tv. Do watch live because I, I pay attention to the chat room and I ask your questions, including that horse-sized duck question. That was from the chat room. I was like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Leo didn't want to know that. Uh, no, the chat room is great. Uh, but if you can't watch, we have uh, on-demand versions after the fact, audio and video available at twit.tv slash TRI or wherever finer internet programming is stored and forwarded. You just go there and download it. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.